Good morning. My name is David from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. By far the most popular visit while exploring different churches has been driving out to Salt Lake City as a Protestant guest to witness the General Conference for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This was absolutely eye-opening, both with what was happening inside with the conference center, with the various talks, the amazing choir, and the focus on Jesus Christ and the family. Compared to the stark contrast of what was happening outside the conference center with various street preachers, many of whom were ridiculing and insulting Latter-day Saints as they were walking in and out of the conference center, it was, a, it was troublesome to see a toxic side of Christianity that I'd never seen before, all due to very different belief sets. There was so much happening in such a short amount of time, like I, there was so much more that I wanted to see. Because Saturday, I was walking in and out with the Latter-day Saints in the conference center. Sunday, I dressed down to basically loiter around with the street preachers and just talk with a few of them. There was so much happening that I didn't even recognize the iconic Salt Lake Temple right in Temple Square. It wasn't until I noticed several church members walking towards this window pane and I noticed several construction workers who were earthquake proofing the bottom foundation of this gigantic temple. Well, after that, I've been genuinely curious to learn more about the church, come back to Utah a second time to explore the beautiful state and, you know, just go full church nerd mode to learn more about the church history and also to attend some new temple open houses that I was invited to that I'll have future videos uh, coming up. So stay tuned for those. For this video, I asked several friends who are church members who live in the Beehive State. Okay, if I'm coming out a second time, where are some places to go? Where should I go to church? And boy, do they follow through. So I was kind of like a bee. I got the chance to buzz around Temple Square. Uh, I got to see the Church History Museum. I went there two different days, I could go there a third. And then also I got the chance to worship at the historic 10th Ward Chapel. Uh, this is a historic pioneer era church. And I, I, from what I understand, it's the longest running LDS meeting house still in existence. Uh, I guess it got organized in 1849 and it should be celebrating its 175th anniversary since first being organized. So I dress like this. I'll share more about this unique church and its history in just a moment. But before we get into that, I'll show a few sites from what Temple Square in the area looked like, along with the chapel, to the sounds of an organ recital from the nearby Salt Lake Tabernacle.
What has typically been the case with many of my Latter-day Saint church visits with this channel, my curiosity finds so much around every corner. For me, this entire trip felt like, like one of those classic TV game shows, the ones where contestants are placed inside this giant supermarket, and they're given a shopping cart, and they have to fill as many groceries as possible into this cart, but they only have like a minute or two to do it. So for me, as I'm buzzing like a bee around Salt Lake City, like I'm loading up my mental cart with all this American and Latter-day Saint pioneer and church history, and suddenly the clock hit zero, and I was just like, I, I need more time. Like, I don't want this to be done yet. When I got back on my plane, and headed back home and things had cooled down, I had to ask myself, why, why do I keep feeling this way? And because like as a, a lifelong Protestant, it, with my background, with my history, um, you know, th the idea of new scripture and modern day prophets is just very, very different to me. And, but at the same point, like the thing that I, I keep finding myself wrestling with is is the negativity that I find from a Protestant perspective going on right now, especially in the increase with social media, especially even here on YouTube. Uh, there was a stretch of time where I would often listen to some of these watchdog uh, Christian YouTube channels. I won't name names, but I would listen to those and it often would focus on rebuking prosperity preachers. And even if you watch some of my earlier YouTube videos, you can see some of that influence trickle into some of my commentary back then. But what I noticed was with this focus, it wasn't so much about talking about Christ or his love for us or to love thy neighbor. It turned much more into a witch hunt to find false teachers and to find false prophets. And one of the passages that is often used is Matthew 7, 15, where it talks about beware of false prophets. Uh, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inside they're like ravenous wolves. Well, there was a time when I met someone who was very interested in my church spiritual project. And uh, he asked me a really good question. He asked if, you know, what type of podcast, what type of YouTube channels were you listening to? So I mentioned one or two that I was listening to, and he responded by asking, would you recommend those to me? And I had to sit for a moment. I had to pause. And I told him no. And suddenly, it, like, it kind of forced it back on myself, where it's like, why do I keep listening to these YouTube channels that just continue to stir discontent inside of me? They weren't fruitful. So the thing that I didn't realize, and especially with this part, with this commentary, like I went, I went to my Bible, I went to Google search real quick. Okay, what Bible passage talks about, you know, the false prophets with the wolves, with the sheep's clothing? And I found it was Matthew 7, 15. But then it was like when I turned my Bible open to it, the very next passage with Matthew 7, 16 mentions, you will know them by their fruits. And to go back to this grocery store analogy, what is the very first thing that you see inside a grocery store? You're greeted by fruits. You're greeted by vegetables. Why is that? Well, it's very strategic because when you first walk into a grocery store, you see fruits, you see these bright colors, you see this freshness. It sets the tone because who wants to walk into a grocery store and the very first thing you see is a bunch of you know, beans and peas in cans that are collecting dust. You want that freshness. And as I've done this YouTube channel, um, one thing that I've been very enlightened by is with several Latter-day Saints, in, in, within, especially with the comments, who share their testimony, who share their fruits. And anytime that I have gone into a Latter-day Saint church, meeting house, what have you, like the very first thing that I notice is the kindness, the fruits, right away when I walk into these buildings. So if you're unaware, in Latter-day Saint theology, uh, the church was restored in 1830 with Joseph Smith. He was divinely handpicked to find and dictate the Book of Mormon as another testament to Jesus Christ, essentially becoming a prophet. Well, obviously this didn't sit well with many, and in 1844 he was killed by a mob. 
which led to a succession crisis for leadership. So I've talked about some of the other restoration branches in other Latter-day Saint videos on this channel, but I never really dug into what happened to the vast majority of Latter-day Saint pioneers that headed out west, led by Brigham Young. So on July 24th, 1847, Brigham Young and the first group of LDS pioneers, uh, after just years and months of going through this treacherous trailblazing terrain, only on wagons and hand wagons, uh, came across a mountain where Brigham Young declared this is the place. So the Latter-day Saint pioneers settled in this area and they had some drawbacks. For instance, you know, with the lake, they were expecting this to be a promised land, but the lake was Salt Lake. You know, they couldn't really do a whole lot with it. Upon settling in the Salt Lake Valley, the church started to lay out its community and started with 19 original wards in 1849. Of those original 19 wards, only the 10th ward square uh, has retained and maintains several of its 19th century buildings. So it offers a very rare glimpse into pioneer history right there in Salt Lake City. So in 1853, it was headed by three Mormon battalion members. Uh, they created an adobe structure that served as a meeting house, as a school, and then also a theater. And eventually that would be demolished years later, but they kept the original lintel that uh, I guess it was from the original bishop who said that education forms the mind, but the soul makes the man. So over the years, they added more buildings. So in 1873, they built a new meeting house that is still used to this day. So it is the longest continually used meeting house that operates within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, they also built a school in 1887 that still stands, and then also a 1909 chapel uh, for where I attended this church service. For the service itself, uh, when I first walked in, I, I headed towards the very back. And as I later learned, and I'll mention in a minute here, was the significance of what the back of this chapel represented. Bishop came up right away, introduced himself, uh, class act, really enjoyed uh, talking with him, and pretty much anyone that I spoke with here uh, was a joy to speak with. So compared to other Latter-day Saint buildings, uh, this was completely different to me, just because it had a number of you know stained glass windows, but also a custom pipe organ that was built into the walls of the chapel. My understanding is this was the very first chapel in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to install a pipe organ within its walls. One of the first hymns that we played, I think, was uh, Joseph Smith's first prayer. And then uh, we took part of the Holy Communion. And as a Protestant, again, it is very different for me to take water instead of wine or grape juice. So I'm still wrapping my head around that. But uh, the gentleman that got up to give the talk was actually moving out of the ward. But during the talk, he mentioned that he had been working on the Salt Lake Temple with the earthquake proofing. And I, I didn't record it, so I can't do any justice for his talk. But it, I, from what I remember, he was explaining how with Christ and how, what they were doing with the temple is it, it's like it's in the world, but it's not of the world. And he referenced all these New Testament and Book of Mormon passages related to Jesus Christ being the light against the darkness. So it was really well done. And after, after his talk and after the service, um, I went full church nerd mode and just try to understand and see everything that was a part of this building. So they had several stained glass windows, but right above those were this, this, the symbolism. So there was one with the Alpha and the Omega to reference Revelation, but the one that stood out the most to me was the beehive. Because when I was flying in from Salt Lake, I had heard of Utah being the beehive state. I had heard of Deseret. But as I was flying in, I was actually reading uh, the first two chapters in the book of Ether. And I'm learning about the Jaredites for the first time in my life. And I remember reading about the Deseret, which was translated to honeybee. And how essentially the original pioneers for Latter-day Saints, how this honeybee working together with this community, this honeybee type of community, 
had such a profound impact with the mentality of those early pioneers that still exist today. And then in the very back, and to me that really brought the whole service together, was a stained glass window in the balcony because it showed Jesus Christ and he's knocking on a door. And I can just imagine with this window, anytime the sun comes up, especially that morning, especially with this gentleman's talk about the light versus darkness, to see that light just shine through this stained glass window, um, it, it just was very, very profound, kind of bringing that all together. So afterwards, um, I later learned that this church had a huge um, correlation, a huge link to President Gordon Hinckley. So the day before, um, I was buzzing around the Church History Museum, and there was an entire exhibit devoted to all the presidents of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout all the years. So again, as a Protestant, this was very different to me. It was so admirable to see the dedication and to give a space for each president and what they did that influenced the church to what it is today. So with the 15th president being President Hinckley, um, I, I just hear so many good things about President Hinckley because he served as president for what sounds like about 13 years, serving from 1995 to 2008. After my last video with a with a t open house temple visit, uh, I talked about families in that video, and I have been overwhelmed, um, humbly overwhelmed, uh, with messages related to President Hinckley's proclamation of the family. So I've been learning about that, and also with President Hinckley uh, really increasing the number of temples built uh, during his tenure. From what I learned later on, President Hinckley actually sat in the back of this chapel when he was 12 years old. His uh, father served as the president of the stake at that time, and he was a new deacon. And it's part of President Hinckley's testimony that day when he first was there because he's hearing all these strong voices of the Latter-day Saints in the back. And to him, you know, many of them had these European accents to them, but to his testimony, it was such a profound impact on him and where he was going, especially with him becoming a future president for the church, serving a very long time, 13 years. To learn about that after the fact that I was sitting towards that back area, um, that, that, that was very interesting to me. And from what I understand, they were looking to, when this 10th Ward Chapel was kind of in disarray, President Hinckley stepped in to assist and make sure that this chapel still exists to this day, to be that echo, to create and to remember that pioneer spirit from over a century ago. That's going to do it for this video. Hope you enjoy this visit to the 10th Ward Chapel in Salt Lake City. I want to give a special thank you to Kelsey, Rob, and Monica for your recommendations and for assisting me for this trip. So thank you very much to you really appreciate it. We'll have future videos uh, for some more temple open houses. Uh, I got a chance to go to Orem and St. George, so make sure to like and subscribe to stay tuned for those visits. But until next time, hope you have a good one.